just remain standing if you would. Wow. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. The verse for this morning is... If you have been raised up in Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Wow. You're going to hear from this later on from the past. Amen. It's so awesome to see all your beautiful faces to those family that just came in. We want to welcome you. Oh, you feel the presence of God the same way we're feeling it. Amen. Amen. Um, what a privilege. I mean, I'm going to pray. I'm going to start praying here quick, but soon. But what a privilege it is that we can come into this building to the house of God and raise our hands with no interference and we can worship our God. And what a privilege we have that he has given us the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, that help us, helps us in our hardships and our weaknesses and in everything we go through. Sometimes we don't realize what a privilege and a blessing that is. We don't deserve it, but he loves us so much that he did it for us. Amen? Because we were lost and we needed to be saved. Raise your hands up. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father. We come to you, Lord, because we know that you are good. You are a good God. You are always with us. And you promised on your word to never leave us nor forsake us, dear Lord. And Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, because we know, Heavenly Father, that you loved us first. That when we were still sinners, Christ, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us and pay the penalty of sin that we owed to sin, Lord. And Jesus took it up on himself and he went on that cross and he died for us and he paid the penalty for us, dear Lord. Thank you, dear Lord. Thank you. Because, Lord, Heavenly Father, we would never been able to pay that price because we were not perfect. But you sent your perfect sacrifice and he did it for us because you love us, dear Lord. And he resurrected on that third day, Heavenly Father, to give us the hope of resurrection, that it doesn't end when we die but that there's a hope, a hope of eternal life, a hope of resurrection for those that are already gone before us, dear Lord. We will see them again, dear Lord. We will see, hallelujah, those that have died in Christ, Heavenly Father, all our loved ones, dear Lord. And we come before you, dear Lord, knowing that you hear us, dear Lord. Like you say in Jeremiah 33, 30, Heavenly Father, cry out to me and I will answer thee. So we have a promise from you, Lord, that you will hear us, and you will answer us, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, I present everybody in the body of Christ that's sick today, dear Lord. I ask you to put your hands of healing over their bodies, dear Lord. I ask you to touch their minds right now. Every confused mind, every hurting heart, every person that's broken, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, you're the God that heals. You're the God that restores. You're the God that puts everything together, dear Lord, and makes us better than what we were before, dear Lord. And you raise us and you put us... Put Put us in high places for your glory, dear Lord, because this is not about us. This is about you, dear Lord, that you receive the glory. You receive the honor, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, you make us new so that the people that are out there on this world, this dying world, could see the work that you have done in us, dear Lord, and you receive the glory, dear Lord. Heal the broken bodies, dear Lord. Heal the broken minds, dear Lord. Heal those that are sick, Lord, that have cancer, diabetes, dear Lord, that are battling all type of infirmities, dear Lord, high blood pressure, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, you can heal it and eradicate it, dear Lord, for your glory, dear Lord. We believe it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We pray for our nation, dear Lord. 
Our nation that's so divided. Our nation, our politicians, dear Lord. Your, bio, your word says that we should pray for our leaders. It doesn't matter who's in power, who's in authority. It doesn't matter, dear Lord. We're not Republicans. We're not Democrats, dear Lord. That doesn't matter to you, dear Lord. We are children of God. Ch uh, we are children of the high kingdom. Of, of We are citizens of heaven, not of this earth, not of this nation, dear Lord. We are citizens, hallelujah, of the heavenly places, dear Lord. And we, pr we believe, Lord, and we come in before you and we pray pray for our leaders. We pray that you that you would save them, dear Lord. Hallelujah. That you would give them wisdom, dear Lord. That you, hallelujah, would forgive their sins, Lord. And we ask you, Lord, to forgive the sins of our leaders. Forgive the sins of this nation. Forgive the sins of our land, dear Lord. Because we need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. We need you to move, hallelujah, like a mighty rushing wind through this whole nation, Lord. And heal the bodies. Heal the people, hallelujah, that are living in sin, dear Lord. Tuck Tug their hearts, Lord. Bring them back to you. Bring this nation back to you, dear Lord. A God-fearing nation, dear Lord. Your word said, blessed is the nation whose, whose, whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And Lord, we claim that the United States of America belongs to you, Lord. It was founded on Christian principles. It was founded, hallelujah, on Christian morality, Lord. And this nation and the devil has raised up to break the morality, to break the morality of our children, to break the morality, hallelujah, of men and women, dear Lord. Oh, God, forgive us. Lord, touch our hearts. Touch the minds of our children. Touch the minds of the parents, dear Lord, that, that we could recognize that there's only two genders not this neutral gender or whatever gender you feel like being, dear Lord. No, that's not, that's not right. That's not a biblical, Lord. You only made man and woman, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, help us to stand on the principle of your word and never sell the, hallelujah, the truth of your word, dear Lord. Raise men and women, raise children that would stand on the truth of the holy word of your holy word, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, the, the devil has, 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 has launched an attack and is, is against, is waged war, hallelujah, against our families and against our children and against the church. The Heavenly Father, that if we don't believe, hallelujah, like they do, then we're in the wrong. We are haters. We're the ones that are not right. That we should be prosecuted and maybe put in jail because, hallelujah, we, are, we don't believe what they believe. But Heavenly Father, we stand and we cry out to a living God. We cry out to a God, hallelujah, who is in control of all things, hallelujah. Heavenly Father, you hold the whole world in your hand, dear Lord. And we cry out to you, Lord. We ask you to have mercy on our nation. Have mercy on our families. Have mercy, dear Lord. We ask you, Lord, for our, school, our schools, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, yesterday I was at a meeting and, and that speaker talked about, and he works in our school system, and he talked about that they want to bring in the LGBTQ, hallelujah, education to our public schools. Heavenly Father, we pray against it. Father, we pray against it, and I ask you to protect our children, dear Lord. I ask you, dear Lord, to protect their minds, because their minds are fragile, hallelujah. Their minds, hallelujah, are easily, hallelujah, probably be deceived because their, their minds are, are tender. But dear God, there's a church that's praying. There's a church that's standing in the gap. There's a church that's, got, that's saying no to the devil, no to those lies. No, hallelujah, to the sin, hallelujah, that they want to impregnate in our children, Lord. We stand against it, Lord. We won't accept it. We won't accept it because you don't accept it. And, Lord, your word is the truth. Bring your word, hallelujah. Seal your word in our hearts and in our minds that we may believe only your truth, dear Lord. I ask for revival, dear Lord. I ask for revival for this nation. I ask for revival for this city. I ask for revival, hallelujah, for every church in Collier County. I ask, dear Lord, that you would move in a mighty and powerful way and bring us back to you, dear Lord. Bring us back, hallelujah, to the simpleness of the gospel. Bring us back to the simpleness, which is, hallelujah, Jesus came as a man, was born as, as, a, as a man, grew up, pray, preached the gospel, died on the cross, and on the third day he resurrected. That is the gospel. We were sinners, hallelujah, and he came to seek and save that which was lost.
and we were lost and you saved us. Thank you. But you also, hallelujah, gave us a responsibility. And you gave us three things that are so important, dear Lord, that we should do every, uh, or, or every, well, every day, Heavenly Father. We should read your word every day. We should pray every day. And we should fast from time to time. Those are the weapons of the church. Those are the weapons, hallelujah, to defeat the devil. Those are the hallelujah weapons so that we can stand against hell when it comes toward us. And we say, no, we are standing here. Hallelujah. You come with me. Hallelujah. With a sword and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the most high Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for being so good to us. Send revival, Lord. Have mercy. Have mercy, dear Lord. We need it more than ever, Lord. We need it more than ever. Change our hearts, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Oh, you may be seated. Whoa. You may be seated this morning. If you're asking, why do we spend so much time in the service to pray like that? Well, the Bible says, Jesus said, my house should be called a house of prayer. And I don't know about you, but I've noticed since we've made prayer such a priority of our services that God is doing something in our midst in a different way. Amen. And I'm so thankful for that. And uh, Brother Daniel, I love your fervency. I love your passion. Uh, you just really scare the devil. And I like people like you that just really scare the devil. Amen. <laughs> Send them running. Send them running. It's so good to see you. I do want to mention all of our, if you happen to have any of the small children, and in case you came, you are welcome to dismiss your kids upstairs to our life kids, those that uh, haven't already left. They may be there, already slipped out. I'm not sure, but I just wanted to make mention of that this morning. I kind of feel uh, like I'm, I'm not fully together when Dana's not standing up here with me because she's so good at making sure all those little things, she'll lean over and say, no, be sure to do this and don't forget that. And so... Um, I'm really having to rely upon the Holy Spirit in a different way this morning, amen. So I'm honored you're here this morning. Last Sunday, I, uh, I shared something with you at the beginning of the message that as I began to share that and I began to speak the message, then when I got home on Sunday, I really felt the Lord was taking me back to what I talked about last Sunday and the Lord just really began to deposit in my spirit a message for this morning. Now, let me go back and mention something I said at the onset of the message last Sunday, in case you wasn't here. I shared with us that at the beginning of the year 2020, in January, if you'll remember, and this is before we even was aware of a thing called coronavirus or a pandemic, I shared with our body, our church family, I guess it was probably the first Sunday, that the word that the Lord put in my spirit for the year 2020 was the word discernment. Not realizing what we were getting ready to step into, and, um, and then I shared with you at the beginning of last year, I felt the word that God was speaking to us for the year 2021 was the, the word was endurance. That God wanted us to concentrate on enduring and being disciplined and being dedicated to stay firm and steadfast. And then I shared with you last Sunday that I felt that the word that God had put in my spirit for his church, our church, and for the believer, the word is trust. That we trust God. That we make a predetermined determination to trust the Lord with our lives and his plan, his sovereign plan over our lives, specifically in this year 2022. And we talked about how that we need to trust God with the process. We went to the book of John and talked about how Jesus talked about the pruning process and how that he allows us to go through these processes so that we can bear more fruit, that we can produce what God desires us to produce. And this morning what I want to do is I want to talk to you and I want to speak out of really what is my favorite Bible verse. I call it my life verse. How many have a life verse? It's just a verse that you cling to and you just seem to, no matter what you go through in life, it seems to be the verse that you just apply in your heart, in your faith that helps you get through some of the most difficult things in life. And I'm going to speak out of my life verse this morning because I want to talk to you this morning about trusting God, kind of a part two of the message. We talked about trusting God in the process. This morning, I want to talk to you about trusting God with your priorities and how that we realign our priorities in such a way that we exemplify a true trust in the Lord. So I'm going to go to the book of Matthew chapter 6. 
verse 33 and verse 34. This verse, Matthew 6, 33, is what I call my life verse. And you're probably familiar with it. It says this. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you. Now, all the things that he's mentioning, you have to pretty much read the entire chapter of Matthew chapter 6. Because Jesus lists all of these things that you and I go after that we need in this life. Provisional things, uh, the clothes that we wear, the food that we eat, uh, strength for the day. All the things that you and I, the, the things that are necessary for our lives. Jesus makes this incredible promise and he says, I'll give you all these things if you just put me first. If you seek my kingdom and my righteousness. And then he says in verse 34, he says, therefore do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So I want to start out by just kind of answering the question, what does it mean to put God first? When, when God makes this, honestly, what kind of seems as a little bit of a, uh, an unreasonable demand, that you put me first above everything in your life. Now, we've, we've, we've probably all heard people explain this, and, and most people would probably say it like this. Sit down and make a list of all the things that's in your life. And God needs to be on the top of that list. God and then your family, uh, you know, your faith, your finances, your health, your career. And so you just number these things. God is first and, and my faith is second and my family is third or you know, your marriage and your kids. And you number all these things. And so, so we kind of bought into this idea that that's how you put God first. That you prioritize all these things and God has to be the top of that list. I want to, for just a moment, erase that. I want, to get rid, I want to get rid of that thought, and I want to get that out of your mind for just a minute. Because I want to introduce a better way that I believe that God wants us to approach this idea of putting God first. Rather than having your list go down, have your list go across and put your family, your faith, your career, your, your health, uh, you know, your, 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 your relationships, uh, all of these things, you put them across, and then what you do is you put God on top of every one of those things. Completely different. Instead of just saying God is first and then this and then this and this and this and this. Instead, what you would rather do is make the list across and say God is going to be first over my faith. God is going to be first over my ministry. God is going to be first above my family. God is going to be first above my health. God is going to be first above my, 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 uh, my career, my calling, my future. When you set your priorities like this, I believe this is what Jesus is trying to explain to us when he says, I want to be first in your life. That you look at all of these areas of your life and you ask yourself the question, is God first? Not just is God first in my life, but is God first over every one of these things? When I have to make a decision about my family, am I considering what God thinks about it? If I'm making a decision about my finances, is God's plan above my plan? So when you look at it this way and you spread it across this way, then you understand that it brings a whole different perspective of what it means to put God or to seek God first. Now, in this message, I want to answer two important questions. Number one is the question, why does God want to be first in the first place? Why is it that he makes such a demand on us that we put him above everything else in our life? The second question I want to answer is the benefits of putting God first over everything in your life. So let's start with the first question. Why does God want to be first? Why does God want to be the top of everything in my life? Well, the first reason is because, number one, God is jealous for you. He's jealous for you. That simply means that God doesn't want anything else to be important in your life, more important than he is, no matter what it is. He's jealous of you. In fact, we, we find that the writer in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, God calls himself jealous, and he says, I, the Lord your God, I am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affections for any other gods. Well, you would say, well, pastor, I don't have other gods in my life. Well, let me explain something to you. Anything that is more important to God in your life is a God in your life. If your finances are more important than God's plan for your finances, then that is a God in your life. If your health, if your phys physical fitness, if your appearance, if your personality, if your charisma, if your career, if anything is more important, if God is not at the top of that list, then in God's view, that is a God. 
And God says, I'm a jealous God. I want to be the top of everything in your list. So he's a, he's a jealous God. And the reason he is, and he has a right to, is because God knows that if we arrive at a place that something else is more important, then we will become dependent on it, and it, we will become controlled by those things in our lives. So, so the Lord sees this as a caution. He basically says, look, if you don't let me be first of all those areas, those areas will control your life. They will take control out of your life. And they will lead you and mislead you and misguide you. And most importantly, he doesn't want those things to be first in your life because he knows that those things cannot sustain you. And so he understands that you have to buy into this idea that it is a better idea that you and I put God first over everything in our life. The second reason that we have to do this is because God wants us, and he reveals this in this verse, God wants us to experience a little bit of heaven on this earth. He, he wants us. We all know that heaven is a great place, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But, but the Lord wants to transfer some of the goodness of heaven into our lives. And the only way that we can make that connection to get some of the goodness of heaven working and flowing and being given in our lives is that we got to seek him first because that's what brings the connection. That's why he prayed this prayer in Matthew 6. Jesus, my, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants to take Whatever the good things are in heaven, he wants you to have a taste of heaven on this earth. And so you have to recognize the only way that you can begin to experience some of the things that God has in heaven on this earth, he's got to be first in every area of your life. You know, I think many Christians kind of get this idea that we live in a pitiful life, we live in this pitiful earth, and we are just a bunch of pitiful Christians, and we're all designed to pass the pitiful test. And then hopefully if we do good, we will inherit eternal life. But everything on this earth is just going to be pitiful until we get there. But I want to tell you, that's not how God wants your life to be experienced. God wants you and I. In fact, he knows for you to fulfill your God-given destiny, you're going to need more than earthly resources. You're going to need some heavenly resources. And the only way that God can get those heavenly resources into your life for you to accomplish what God has willed for you and placed in your heart to do and give you the desires of your heart, he's got to be first. And if he's first and he sees that in the area of your life, God wants to touch heaven. God wants to touch your life with heaven. God wants to touch your finances with heavenly blessings. God wants to bless your marriage with heavenly power and heavenly influence. God wants to bring some of heaven on this earth so that you will understand that God can be trusted. The third reason why I believe that it's very important that we understand why God wants to be first, and this is probably a hard one for us to understand, is that because whatever's first in your life controls your heart. Whatever's first, if, 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 if God is not first in your finances, it controls your heart. If God is not first in your calling, in your career, in your agenda, then it will control you. Your agenda will control your life. If God is not first in your thinking, in your mind, then the thoughts that are in your mind that are not of God will control your life. You listen to this preacher this morning. Somebody needs to hear this. It will control your life. It controls your desires. It will control your passions. It will control the emotions of your heart. And the writer in the Proverbs tells us about the importance of guarding our hearts because, because all, out of our heart flows all the issues of our life. If God is not first in my life, the truth is God does not control what's going on in my heart. And if God is not controlling what's going on in my heart, then God is not controlling what's going on in my life, plain and simple. So God says, listen, I want to be first in your life because if you don't have me first, then whatever's there... Is going to control your life. And if you let it control you, it will ruin your life. Not just the plan that God has for you. It will ruin your life. It will completely ruin your life. If it doesn't line up with what God wants and if it's not allowing God to be first. So let's answer the second question. Why is putting God first in your life the best life? Why is it God's desire? Why putting God first in your life is the most important thing? 
Well, I'm going to give you a number of reasons. The first of all is this. It's because when you learn to do this and you walk in a habit of doing this, you begin to discover who God really is. You find out what God is really like. Now, most all of us, even before we got saved, begin to develop some kind of perception of God. We all have in our journey, most especially here in the United States, because, you know, we, we've, we've been kind of brought up in a Christian nation. So almost everybody in the United States, at least in the, that's been, you know, brought up in the last couple of, of generations or decades, uh, whether you knew God or not or had a personal relationship with God, you, 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 you somehow was taught some kind of theology and understanding about God. Now, here's the danger. If you didn't have a relationship with Him, more than likely, your perception of God before you got saved is not the right perception. In fact, I believe there's still some Christians today that still have bad theology. And part of that is because they still are buying into what they perceived God was before they got saved. And so they've never been able to find the heart of God. And I'll be truthful with you because the writer in Isaiah says, God says, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So let's, let's be honest. You cannot reckon in your mind some of the things that God expects of us because it seems unrealistic. This demand here almost seems selfish of God. Put me first above everything else. Some would say that God's got an inferior complex because he's insecure. He's not insecure. He's jealous of you. He loves you that much. And so this, this demand that God has, that if you don't walk in a habitual relationship with Jesus Christ to know Him and to trust His Word and to trust His plan and get to know Him personally, then you will never understand the goodness of God. And so when we learn to walk, one of the benefits we do, the longer we walk in this journey, the more we begin to discover the goodness of the Lord. That He is so trustworthy in times like this. The Apostle Paul makes mention of this in, in Ephesians chapter 1. In verse 17, he admonishes us, first of all, to know who God really is. And in verse 18, he prays this prayer. In, in Ephesians 1 and 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened in order so that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of the glorious inheritance of his holy people. So if you and I don't have a proper perspective of God, we will never be able to fully trust God. We will never be able to fully trust God. Now let me just pause here and just interject something here. Because I think this is important that we stop and put this in here right now. I asked the Lord the question, God, why did you set on my heart? And did you want me to begin this year talking about trusting you? Is there things going to happen this year that, that are going to shake us up, that are going to be more difficult than what we've faced in the last two years? Is there something that, that, that we are not yielding to you and so you are just putting a greater demand upon us and I'll be true with you I don't have the full answer of this but I do believe this I believe that when God puts a demand on us to trust him it tells me that God is up to something and he's about to do something and I want to say to you right now we need God to do something we need God to do something the truth is what we want God to do and how he does it doesn't always line up and so in order for God to do what he wants to do and probably what we want him to do, he may go about doing it a way that we don't understand. Therefore, we have to completely trust God. I stand here this morning and tell you, I don't have a clue what's going to happen in 2022. I don't have a clue the direction that things are going to line up. I don't know the speed. I don't know the steps. I don't know how quick God is going to do this or that according to prophecy. But I do believe this. God is fully in control. And God is wanting to do something great in our lives. But we got to predetermine that we're going to trust him. Don't wait until you get in the moment that you contemplate. Because more than likely, your emotions are going to be stirred up. And you're going to have a hard time discerning what you need to do. Listen. If this is going to be the year that God rewards your labor and this is the year that God decides to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you, then you trust him fully with the blessing. If this is the year that God says, I'm going to break some things in your life, I'm going to shatter some things in your life, I'm going to remove some things in your life, I'm going to allow you to walk in places that are difficult, then determine now that you are going to trust him. And here's the reason why. Because he's faithful and you can always count on God to be trustworthy. Here's the second point of this. 
why putting God first is the most important thing is because in doing so, we then are able to receive whatever God has for us. There is so much good that God wants to do in every person's life in spite of your badness. How about that? He's not waiting for you to get gooder. He's not waiting for you to become a better version of who you already are. He just wants you to let him do it. And more than likely, when he does it, your faith is going to rise up so much that it's going to change you. It's going to make you better. Because you're going to realize that in spite of you, God decided to do something good in your life. Again, this is some of the bad theology that we earn it from God. The, the request is simple. Put me first. Not put me first in all these other steps. Just put me first. He knows that we're still earthly. He knows that we are still wrestling with carnality and emotions. He knows that we still have to sacrifice our will and we have to crucify our flesh every day. And some days we're better at it than others and some days we're not. But in spite of all that, he wants to be good and he's got good things he wants to do for us. One of the things that he wants to do, and, and this can be very easily missed. In this prayer, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Okay? Now, he doesn't mean go after being right. He's not saying go after trying to be gooder, better. I know I'm making up the word gooder. I know you guys said, does he know that's not proper English? It is today because it's an anointed word. <laughs> gooder is a good word today. He, he knows that, that we are prone to think that we earn. And, and so to go after righteousness does not mean that I go after doing better. Now, there's nothing wrong with attempting and, and, and willing and determining to, to walk more pure and honest and holy in obedience to the Lord. But here's the thing. In our own strength, we cannot do that. We just cannot do that. We can get stirred, we can get emotional, we can get passionate about something, but the truth be known, unless the Lord is transforming our thinking and we're getting the revelation of his righteousness, we will never be able to reach the righteousness that he's telling us that we got to come up to. So what does this mean? Why is this important? I think it's the most important question. He's basically saying this to us. When you begin to get close to me, one of the things that you will receive is a revelation that I am your righteousness. Now you say, well, that's not revelation to me. I don't get that. And then that means you need to get there. When you get closer to God, you understand that your striving to be righteous does not bring you to a righteous place. You strive for God, and in doing so, you begin to experience the love of God bringing righteousness over to your life. And at first, that doesn't sound like much, but here's the reality. Without God taking precedent over every area of my life, I will fail miserably at being in right standing with God. Being a Christian is not living for Christ. Being a Christian is letting Christ live through you. A huge difference. So when you get close to God, you begin to experience the life of Christ in you and you begin to let him live through you and as he lives through you you understand that you are entering into the righteousness of the Lord and there your mind is filled with the grace and the mercy of God and there you are able to fight off the condemnation and the orphan spirit that you are never truly a son or a daughter of God when he sees that you are flawed as you are struggling as much as you are with the history that you have and even the struggles in your present, he still sees you as his child and he declares that you're righteous. Why is this important? Why is it important we seek not just God but after his righteousness? Is because until you get there, you will struggle with guilt and shame as a Christian. And there's nothing, I don't believe, anything that can wear down your Christian strength as much as trying to, to live victorious while you're fighting guilt and shame. It will wear you 
down as a Christian. And it's easy to fall in the trap that how you win the battle over guilt and shame is to do more good. And I want to tell you something. It only, it only gives you a sense of victory for just a moment. And then you're back in the perpetual cycle of trying to earn the righteousness and the goodness of God. God says, just love me. Just put me first. Just trust me. Just trust me. Just trust me even though you still have emotions that are not healthy, thoughts that are wearing you down, that you're not perfect yet. Just trust me with your life. And as you learn to do that, you will begin to sense all of that worry and all of that guilt and all of that shame leaving your life. I have to say this, and this is more personal, I guess. I, I was brought up, I and mean, most of you guys know my life, my story, pretty transparent. I was brought up learning this principle, putting God first. And I think for the most of my life, I was good at this. But let me tell you one, let me give you just one snippet of my life that I failed miserably in this. When I went to college, I graduated from high school and I entered into ministry school, Bible college. It was there that I began to start on my own reorganizing my priorities. And that turned out to be a very big mistake for me. But it was also one of the greatest learning lessons that I ever learned because I learned that God's mercy is much greater than my failure. And I, I learned that he can be trusted no matter what time or what hour or what season, I bring him into my mess. And there was a few specific lessons that I learned. This is not on PowerPoint, but I think these are some pretty powerful points. One of the things I learned is that the deception of the heart starts the moment you begin to ignore God's nudges. When you begin to ignore the nudges of God, a deception will begin to start coming into your heart. As a believer, you know what I'm talking about. I call it your knower. That little place on the inside of you that says, uh-uh, don't say that, don't do that, don't post that, don't hit send, don't type that. Come on, anybody got a knower? You better hope you got a knower. If you don't have a knower, then you don't know what you're getting ready to get yourself into. You need a knower. He's called the Holy Spirit. Let me get Pentecostals, the Holy Ghost. Is that all right? Did I scare anybody when I said that? The Holy Ghost. All the same, Holy Spirit. He's the knower. And He's the one that prompts you and says, you better hear what I'm saying. The moment you begin to ignore those little nudges of the Holy Spirit, then you begin to bring deception into your life. I learned that. The second thing I learned through that time was I also learned that guilt and shame is more than just an emotion. They are chains and they are walls that will paralyze your progress. When you get to a point where you're not putting God first and you're rearranging your priorities, then it's going to leave you with a sense of guilt and shame. And that's not just an emotion. That is something that becomes a chain to your life and it becomes a wall that begins to paralyze your life. And the third thing I learned, which is more importantly, I learned that if you will eventually put your total confidence in God and the wisdom and the sovereignty of God, no matter what you've done and no matter how far you've made a mess of it, He will always turn everything around and turn it and make it for your good. And I learned that. And the reason I tell you that is because we all know what it's like to get our priorities out of sorts. I think if one thing has probably happened in the last year or two, it's focus has caused us to recognize, it's revealed to us the truth about what is important in our lives and what we have allowed to become important that should not be. The third reason that I think that we need to see this as such a blessing is because in Jesus, and again, these are the scriptures he promised us. When you make God first over every priority of your life, here's, especially today, this may not have preached as good 10 years ago, but I think it preaches good today. It keeps us away from a worried, filled life. It keeps us worry-free. I've read this verse a lot. I've read this chapter a lot. You've been a part of this church. I've preached Matthew 6 a lot. And when Jesus says, take no thought about tomorrow, don't worry about any of those things, you won't need to worry about it. I will take care of you. When he says, don't, worry sometimes I say to God well somebody's got to worry about it 
and you don't seem to be worrying about it, God. Have you ever felt like that you got to worry because it's your duty? That if you don't worry about it, it's going to get ignored, it's going to get worse? I believe that's why... I, I, I know it sounds like I'm kind of being silly, but I'm being truthful. I think there are some people who feel like that worry is a responsibility. Uh, it's, I'm just being responsible. Being cautious. There's nothing wrong with being cautious. But there's a difference between being, being cautious and worrying about something to such a degree. Now look at what Jesus says. And, I mean, you know, you say, well, I only believe everything that Jesus says, but I don't necessarily believe everything the apostles said or what Paul said or, you know, some of the other prophets. But, you know, Jesus, you know, you tell me what Jesus said. Well, first of all, you need to believe the whole Bible. But if you are one of those that says, I only take to heart the red letters. Okay, well, listen to what Jesus said. Verse 32. Only people who don't know God are always worrying about such things. Your Father in heaven knows you need all these. And what are the, all the things? All the things. Go read chapter nine or chapter 6. It would be a great study for you this afternoon at lunchtime. Get your Bible out at the restaurant and read it. All these things, he says, you don't have to worry about in life. All the things that we worry about in life, your health, your provision, the resources that you need, the troubles, the spiritual things that comes against us. He says, don't worry about these things. From chapter 6, verse 25 through 33, he basically says everything in life that you would worry about, he says, don't worry about. And then he, and I'm going to paraphrase, and then in verse 34, he says, and don't even, not only don't worry about today, but don't worry about tomorrow either, because I got it covered too. Isn't that good of God? That he says, you know what? You don't even, not only don't need to worry about today, but I've already got, come on, I've already got tomorrow taken care of, so don't worry about tomorrow either. Don't worry about your future. There is a reason why Jesus is adamant about trying to keep us away from worry. There's a reason. Because he knows of all the destructive things that comes in small has the ability to take over every area of your life. And it normally starts with something as simple as just worry. Now let me tell you something about worry. It can become a habit in your life. Somebody help me preach this morning. If you're not careful, you can develop a, an emotional habit of worrying. And i got to say something to all of us that's getting up there in age. It's one of the things that you got to fight more. I had this grand idea that once my kids got married, I would never worry about my kids. <laughs> Wasn't that a lot? They're adults now. Let me tell you something. I think I struggle with worrying more about my kids now than I did when they were infants and toddlers getting ready to put their hand in the oven. I mean, it's a struggle that I have, that we all probably do. And as you get older, I mean, this, this, I'm not making this up. I think it was Monday morning. I woke up, and I started to get out of bed, and I felt something that didn't feel right. I felt a pain. I thought, now, how did I hurt myself by just sleeping? <laughs> Come on, anybody know how to hurt yourself just by doing nothing? <laughs> the older you get the more you find opportunity to worry about something. And it can become a habit in your life. And the problem is, you don't even realize it's a habit. Again, I think there are some people that think it's a responsible thing to worry. And the Lord says it is irresponsible to worry. Because He wants you to trust Him in everything in your life. Now, you've heard the term, and I'm going to say it carefully so you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. This seems like a big ask. Some of you just caught that. God, you don't, you mean that you don't want me to worry about anything? Winston Churchill said this. When I look back on all the worries, I remember the story of an old man who said on his deathbed, he said, quote, I had a lot of troubles in my life, most of which never happened. Worry is a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. If encouraged, 
It cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. Another quote, if you treat every situation as a life and death matter, you'll die a lot more times. (laughs) That's so true. Jesus goes on in this chapter and he, he says something in just a few verses before verse 33 and he uses this analogy. In verse 26, he says, look at the birds of the air. Pay attention to them. They don't produce their food. The only effort they make is the effort that God gives them just to go get it. He will provide it. That's the only effort. You just make the effort. You use what I've given you to go get it, and I'll make sure it's there when you go get it. You almost have to look at every tomorrow as having two handles. You can either grab the handle of anxiety or you can grab the handle of faith. Which one are you going to grab? Which one are you going to take hold of? I like how Robert Elliott said it. He said, rule number one is this. Don't sweat the small stuff. Rule number two is this. It's all small stuff. In God's perspective, it is. And that's why he says, why are you worried about that? Why do you feel like it's a responsible thing to worry? What good comes from that? It will eventually come in and it begins to drain every source of thought in your life. Here's the fourth reason that God says, put me first over everything. All your priorities, trust me, trust me, trust me. And I'm going to take a couple extra minutes to, to, to explain this. Number four is this. When you learn to do this, it puts you in a place where God is able to start putting heaven in your heart. I've done a lot of funerals over the last two years. Too many. Last Saturday, I, had, I was a part of two funerals. It just occurred to me over the last two years, and I think I speak on behalf of a lot of people, that we have become too attached to this earth. In, in, the, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, one of the things that I, I, I love to see, and you, you look at the Apostle Paul's writings, you look at all of those that were coming to that point of they were getting ready to transition out of this life. They, they, they kept heaven always in plain view. No matter what. Everything was about there. That was the most important thing. And, and why that's important is because when you are able to get the proper perspective that heaven resides in your heart and that everything you and I go through in this life And the things that you and I misunderstand that God permits. When when you are being influenced with heavenly thoughts. And you're reminding yourself that you are a pilgrim passing through. As Daniel said in the prayer a little while ago. Then you begin to understand that there are going to be things in this life that's never going to work out. But you always keep in mind that you're on a journey. This is not the destination. It's not. This is not the final destination. And the Bible actually makes several mentions. I won't go into it this morning because I don't have time. But it makes several mentions about you and I, and I use the term, being heavenly minded. Jesus even mentions in this chapter, he says about setting things in heaven. Set your affection on things. Put your treasures in heaven and not on this earth. I ask you again, do you have heaven in plain view? Have you lost sight of all of this? You know, when we lived in Ohio, and I don't know how many people are familiar with the Amish culture, but we we were very close to where a lot of the Amish communities, a lot of the Amish cultures live. And one of the beautiful things about the the Amish culture is they, they seem to do a really good job of keeping things in proper perspective 
as it relates to death. Um, they, they just have this, I don't know, they just, I don't know if they teach it in their daily or weekly uh, devotions or time in church, but, but they, they, they seem to have this great grasp that no matter what they go through in this life, it's worth it so long as we gain heaven. I'm going to tell you, most of us as Christians fail in that area right there. Have we got to the point to where we think that everything that God wills for us is all about this? Let me, let me tell you something. Let me, go, let me use an Old Testament term. Your promised land is not here. Heaven is our promised land. And here's the thing. What motivates the will of God in your life is eternity. And what is more important to God is not what I'm going through today, but what I'm going through, where is it going to lead me in eternity? That's the most important thing to God. And while it may seem insensitive to God, and again, we keep going back to trusting, while it seems insensitive to God to let us go through something, I tell you what, I, and I mentioned about I've done a lot of funerals, and don't get me wrong, I love earth, I love living, I love being around everybody, but I tell you, the more I get around uh, deaths and funerals and all these kind of things, and the more I begin to see the realities of what we live in, not because of worry, but just because of the realities of things, I find myself getting homesick more, wanting to go to heaven more. How much is that in us? How much do we have that? And this is why he said, but seek first the kingdom of God. Now, in some translations, it says the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying that if you'll set your affections on heavenly things instead of earthly things, you won't become consumed by the worry and the troubles that earthly things bring to us. In fact, look and just examine how the, the message of the gospel is being preached over the last decade or so. Everything is about the best life here. Everything is about, you know, getting all that you can of this life and, and, and getting so blessed that you're just, you're never messed up. And just, you, everything's just God making your life so good on this life. And believe me, He wants to give you a good life. But I want to tell you something. I'm afraid we've made the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ that God wants to save you and give you a better life. That's not the message. The message is God wants to save you and give you eternal life. That's the message of the gospel. The message, the message. You're going to have to go through some stuff in this life that's not going to feel good, that's not going to be fair, that's not going to be easy. But he says, if you keep your eyes upon me, Paul says, look into Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of your faith. Let him lead you. Let him take hold of you. You take hold of him. You trust God. You, if you keep heaven in view, in plain view, You'll be amazed at how much easier it is to walk through these things knowing that as Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Have we lost the desire for heaven? Have we become so earthly that we would rather have God just bring heaven to us? He wants to give us some of heaven on this earth, but ultimately he knows that the better plan, the best plan, is for us to go to heaven. Early believers, they kept this in their heart. It was plain view for them. It's all about heaven. It's all about getting there. There are so many moments that I think we've all experienced in the last two years. I was in Cleveland, Tennessee just a few months ago, well, actually just a little over a month ago, for a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Tony Lane, who passed away because of COVID. That name is probably familiar with you because he's the gentleman that myself and several staff in this church went to the Philippines with him 11 times. He was the director of that. Dana and I went to Germany with him. Did some ministry at the school over there in Stuttgart, Germany. Close friend. 
when I was in that funeral sitting there, Mark Swank is another minister. He's in the executive offices there in Cleveland. He's a good friend. He was sitting next to me in the little town of Cleveland. They've been hit hard with a lot of loss and death. It's a little community and everybody knows everybody. I leaned over at Mark and I said, this has kind of become a weekly occurrence for all of you in this general office is coming to somebody's funeral. Young, dying. And as I was saying that, I forgot that Mark himself, unfortunately, lost his wife just a little over a year ago. And it, I forgot about it. He looked at me. I mean, I could just feel it. You could just feel the weight of all of that. He said, yeah. He said, I'm at the point now where I've got more to look forward to there than I do here. You know, maybe part of what we're going through right now is to break the grip of this earthly life so that we will desire the real best life that God has for us. It will help you go through the hardships and the trials of this life when we set God as the very thing we go after first, his kingdom and his righteousness. See, the thing is, the Lord has proven his way is right. He's proven he can be trusted. He's proven that he's faithful. He's proven that he's very merciful and gracious. He's proven that no matter what time in your life or your season you turn to him, he will be there to help you. He's proven to be right every single time. So when he says, put me first over everything in your life, I'll take worry away from you. You'll begin to experience what heaven is really like so you'll love heaven more than this earth. You'll be able to get through this life without being drained by worry and consumed by the earthly affairs that are just temporary. Ask yourself, have you got to that point? Have you made worry a habit in your life? Are you struggling to let go of something that you're not sure if you put in God's hands, if he's going to handle it the way you want him to? Today, I believe the Lord is saying, trust me. Stand with me this morning. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know. future and life is worth the living just because he lives sing it again because he lives I can face tomorrow be because he lived, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Sing it. Because he lives, I can face
just a moment I want you just begin to take whatever's on your worry list right now some of you've got a worry list whatever's on your worry list I want you to take it out of your hands and put it in God's hands I want you right now just say God you know I've been struggling with this I've been concerned I've been worried about this God I need you to take this because it's consuming my life Probably everybody in this room, you've got something that you have allowed to consume you to the point where it's controlling your life and affecting what you need to be doing for the Lord. So would you just take your hands and just lift it up to the Father right now. Father, we give those things to you this morning, Lord. We release all the cares and concerns of this life. We surrender everything we have, God, to your hands. Our children, our family, our marriage, our future, our health. We give it to you right now, Father God. Lord, some of maybe some people have made this a habit. So the chain, the wall needs to be broken. It needs to be torn down. The enemy has found a way to consume their life and take away their joy and strength because of the worry. Come on, just begin to let the Lord begin to give you that confidence that you can give it all over to Him. We release it, Lord. give it to you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Sweep over my spirit forever I pray in Just remain standing for just a moment. Father, this morning I pray, God, that you will take the hearts of every person, every listener, whether they're watching online or they're in this room today, God. I believe, God, this is the year that you are declaring that the greatest decision we can make is to put our trust in you and nothing else but in you. Help us, God, today to say, you, Lord, are first over every area of my life. I seek you first, your kingdom and your righteousness. And all these things are added to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord praise this morning. Could you do that? It's, it's so good to see you this morning. Don't forget... When you leave this morning, you can give your tithe and offerings either in the box or the kiosk. I think our students are selling a little bit of heaven on earth today. There's some Krispy Kremes out there. I don't know if they're sold yet or not. I don't know how many they have left. Are they gone or they still have some more? They have more? Okay, I told them to save me a box or two. Uh, but that's already the Lord giving us a piece of heaven right there. That's, that's food that I think will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Have a great day, a great week. We will see you next Sunday, if not before. God bless you.